Yeah, so February hasn't really been my month. It's been a rough one for me. Um, first of all, this video should have come out quite some time ago, definitely before Valentine's Day, but I got COVID, and I was out of the game for a while. Then a couple days ago, I woke up in the morning to find that my goldfish, Bobcat Goldthwait, had died. Had that guy for five years. And then recently, I was about to record and edit, and I lost all the power in my apartment. And it just so happened that we lost all the power in my building because we lost all the power in all of Midtown. And it was great, and I uh, hated every moment of it. And now, as I record this, I'm just getting over almost having panic attacks all day. So, here we go. I haven't played the game Monopoly in a while. It's been about two decades. Let's stick to original Monopoly. The game is crazy enough as it is. How can an iron be a landlord? And the reason for that is because the last time I played, I got very angry, and I realized afterwards that I shouldn't subject anybody to that side of me ever again. But it's not just the game Monopoly that makes people angry. It's the mon Monopoly. And that was a terrible transition. You know, we're all familiar with the whole Swiftgate thing, right? It's that thing that caused American senators to quote Taylor Swift lyrics. A few million Taylor Swift fans would respond, this is why we can't have nice things. It's a nightmare dressed like a daydream. To have a strong capitalist system, you have to have competition. You can't have too much consolidation, something that unfortunately for this country, as a uh, ode to Taylor Swift, I will say, we know all too well. I had hoped, um, uh, as of a few months ago, to get the gavel back. But once again, she's cheer captain, and I'm on the bleachers. Master ought to look in the mirror and say, I'm the problem. It's me. But uh, what was that all about? People were really upset that they couldn't get Taylor Swift tickets. <gasps> First, there was the anticipation. But when the queue opened up to finally buy tickets for Taylor Swift's upcoming stadium tour, oh, no, what just happened? for fans, the Swifties went from freaking out are you joking? What? <laughs> to melting down. The tickets you have selected have been released. Ah! The line has stopped moving. The website fully crashed. I waited in line for like six hours. And it turns out one of the reasons for this was a monopoly by Ticketmaster and Live Nation due to a merger in 2010. When the Live Nation and Ticketmaster merger was approved back in 2010, it was under the condition of a consent decree. Among other things, forbidding Live Nation from retaliating against a venue for using a ticketer other than Ticketmaster. After an investigation, in 2019, the Justice Department alleged Live Nation had repeatedly violated this provision of its decree. Meltdown heard round the world. Ticketmaster's massive site crash during the fan pre-sale for Taylor Swift's Eras Tour sent Swifties into a frenzy and has sent Senate into action. Now the ticketing giant is the focus of a series of Senate hearings that start tomorrow that will put this company's CFO on the hot seat. Live Nation hosts the shows while Ticketmaster sells the tickets. And since a large number of venues already have deals with Ticketmaster, and now with Live Nation, Ticketmaster controls a lot of venues, so, so artists have no say over who can sell those tickets. Which means that Ticketmaster sets up the price for those shows, and artists just have to uh, shake it off. <laughs> I did that thing what the senators did. Mr. Lawrence, I'm going to stick with you for a minute because you made it clear that you do not set the ticket price. And Mr. Berktold said he doesn't have anything to do with the ticket price. Who does set the ticket price? That's an excellent question. That was actually the thing I was most surprised to hear in um, Mr. Berktold's speech because um, we definitely have absolutely no say. And if we actually ask the venues in advance, which we often do, they say that's a ticket master thing. So uh, the fees, I mean, we actually do set, sorry, the ticket prices, the base price, the artist does have a say in setting for sure. But those added ticket master service fees, we have absolutely no say. And the venues claim that it's a ticket master. A monopoly is a 
market where one business acts as the only supplier of goods or services. Companies that create monopolies dominate an industry to the point where other potential competitors cannot enter that marketplace. You know, like when a big store moves into a small town and sets the prices so low that all the other stores in that small town go out of business and then they hike the prices back up because now they're the only ones that are selling you things. It's like that, but with Taylor Swift tickets. And I know, sometimes it feels like everyone is a sexy baby and you're just a monster on a hill. Um, actually, I can't really make that one fit. It's Because uh, the Ticketmaster is the sexy baby. Live Nation is the... No, because there's a... It doesn't matter. <clears throat> so what happened was... It, and then Ticketmaster goes ahead and cancels Swift's concert ticket sales to the general public. So, of course... People are saying, what can we do and how can we stop this from happening again? Millions of Taylor Swift fans found out last fall there are few consequences for failing to deliver the service. But Taylor Swift, I think it's important for our colleagues and all to note, is just one example. Whether it's Bruce Springsteen or BTS or Bad Bunny or in the past Pearl Jam or the Pixies, Fans, artists, and venues are facing real issues with Live Nation. What am I saying? You might hear the term anti-monopoly work and be thinking, ugh, that's not something I want to deal with. But, but this can drive up prices and really affect our lives, not just in ticket prices, but in a lot of different things. Like how Amazon will push their products ahead of other products on Amazon, or Google will do the same thing. These are big companies that have multiple things that they do and are able to push their own thing on you. So people are saying it's time to put a stop to this and it's time to stand against companies like this. So I don't know. Let's all join the fight. Five, six, oh. seven, eight. And some of you may have experienced Valentine's Day a few uh, days ago. And it can seem like couples have a monopoly on that holiday. And it can kind of feel like singles have been left out. And if you grew up in the evangelical world, being single usually made you feel left out. Hey everybody, thank you so much for liking and subscribing and commenting and all that wonderful stuff you do because you're all wonderful people. I put the links below for the social media as well as the Patreon, so you can go down there, clickety-click, and uh, there's some links for merchandise as well, so you could get some of that and have some fun and rep us around the town. Being single is weird. It's a strange thing, especially as you get farther into adulthood. Some people just don't know how to react to you. Is just by yourself? Yeah. Sucks. Or the way they do is in a cruddy way. Friends think it's okay to comment on the state of your apartment or even let you know they thought it would have been messier. Like that would ever be okay to say to somebody with a family or even just a couple who live together. People are shocked when you can do basic things like dress up nice or cook a fancy meal. How many in your body? I'm alone. Alone? I literally had so many people worried and talked down to me when I said I wanted to adopt a cat. That's a big responsibility, you know? Yeah, I was literally 39 when I adopted him. I got this. I didn't say that when you had your fourth kid. We're good. Or you do things like, hey, I'm going to fly across the country to see my family. And then you're sat at the kids' table because you're not married. You're basically a child. Bosses just assume that your time is less valuable than your married coworker. And in general, people are kind of shocked when you have plans and can't do something. But like I said... It's even more annoying when you're single and an evangelical. If I don't get married soon, I'm ever gonna get married. But no, it, that's definitely something that uh, weighs heavy on a lot of people's hearts. Well, in our churches, um, we have classes and programs for children. We often have those sort of classes for married couples, um, elderly. Um, but we often don't have what some people would say a place for singles in, in our ministries. 
And, and maybe that's, that's true of some churches, certainly not true of, of our church here, but our question has to do with how, how, does, how does a church or maybe um, a pastor, how does one minister to singles in the church? They're obviously uh, in a situation, um, sort of an in-between situation, neither here nor there. They, they, they were once an adolescent, now they're maturing, and, and they're, they're maybe wanting to be in a different place, such as a married uh, person and sort of in this in-between uh, stage of life. How do you minister to singles? When I was winding down my time as a church attendee, I was going to this church that a number of my friends were going to. It was on the same block as where I lived, it played good music, and I could usually convince people to go for brunch with me afterwards. I didn't really buy what they were preaching, but uh, I was trying. One of the last Sundays I ever attended was what they called Small Group Sunday. Instead of having a regular service, they put tables up and had food, and people would take turns going up and saying what kind of small group they represented and why you should join them. Group after group went up and gave their pitches. Almost every group was for married couples. There was one for divorced people, one for widows, and one for single women. And there were zero that welcomed single men who had never been married. I had never felt less welcomed at a church. And that's saying something. But at that point, I already pretty much knew that the church was not made for single people. You know, everyone goes through singleness. It's one of the phases that every single person will go through at some point in life. Even when I was looking for videos to watch for this, I noticed that a lot of the titles of the videos were things like Hope for the Christian Single, Finding Peace in Singleness, Finding Purpose in Being Single. You'd think we were talking about finding out you have a life-threatening illness. Ted, we found you in the park throwing rocks at old couples. Why should they be happy? Let me, let me say this to you. In light of the Word of God, we must not think of singles as second class, uh, a second class of... Christians. They're not second best. They're not weird. They're not, they are a gift from God to the church. We need them. They need us. And, and so let's not view singles as a second class, uh, but begin to see and rejoice in the good gift that they are to the body of Christ and the picture they represent about the breadth of God's love. If you're an organization that treats anyone like second class citizens, then you have a big problem, and you should be striving really hard to fix those problems. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that it's probably not just single people you treat as second-class citizens. What I have in mind here, and I think uh, what is in view here, is those who from birth will not pursue a sexual relationship with another, either because of a defect or uh, maybe even they are uh, sexual or maybe even, and if you'll indulge me here, they struggle with same-sex attraction and therefore will be celebrate by birth. And there it is. Yeah, I'm sure this isn't the most welcoming place for a lot of people. Did he say asexual? Or uh, maybe even they are asexual or... Is, it like, is he trying to say asexual? I mean, at least he's mentioning us. Now, what I'm not trying to concede is that there is any, when all said and done, evidence to support that we are born that way. Uh, although, as Christians, even if science were to somehow prove one day that you are born that way, uh, you can be born with all sorts of bents towards what is sinful and not be allowed to indulge in those bents. We like science when it agrees with us, and not so much when it doesn't. To quote people in my comment section, they don't struggle with same-sex attraction. They are really good at it. Say all the time that they are in a season of waiting, where they are waiting on God to bring them that significant other in their life. But what if that season is less about waiting and actually more about becoming? So today, we're going to be talking about Christian singleness and ways that you can prepare yourself for future relationships. So stay tuned. We're talking about being single and how you can use this time to be less of a loser. Like with this conference that had to talk about how awesome it is to be single, but then use the time that they were introducing the only single person on the panel to talk about how they would find her a husband. Manushka Charles. Yeah. Just... What's up, Blue Conference? 
Mari is uh, one of the pastors on our team and helped us plant the church and just does a phenomenal job. And she's actually representing all the single people in the house today as we talk. <laughs> That's a big weight. Well, the burden of all singles. I'm gonna, I'm gonna prophesy after a single and secure party okay. is happening tonight. Yes, it is. And I'm walking into that room and I'm gonna find your husband. <laughs> okay. Let's start looking. Yeah. It is a difficult time for people. I think some of that has to do with wrong perspectives, even in the church of singleness. I mean, our, our expectation is that everyone is going to get married and that certainly is the norm, mm -hmm. but the result of that is that sometimes we, I think we can contribute to singles feeling like there's something wrong with them, especially if they're older and they're not yet married. Where do I fit in? Who can I hang out with? Again, if you're not college age, you know, if you're in your mid thirties or your forties and you're not married, it can, it can lead to a sense of isolation and loneliness. And so I think one of the things we can do is just teach what the Bible teaches about the benefits of singleness. I mean, Paul wasn't shy about that. There are benefits to being mm -hmm. single. Yeah, because getting married and having kids has been propped up as next to godliness because it's the only way they can make sure they have future generations attending their services. It's way easier to make little Christians than convert already existing people. So when people don't conform to this, they get ostracized. Except sometimes... The topic of being single comes up, and pastors try to talk about it in a non-condescending way, because when you read the Bible, it actually says singleness is a gift. Because at the time the Bible was written, uh, being the doomsday cult that early Christianity was, early Christians thought that they were the last generation, and making families wasn't as huge of a priority as it is for the church today. It was a doomsday cult, and it kind of still is in a lot of ways. So he's saying God has ordained that we all live in a season of singleness. Why? Because he wants us to have a worldview and a lifestyle that fits the moment we're in in history. That God wants to champion a way of thinking and a way of living in all of us, and so he will give all of us a season of singleness to cement that given the context we live in, which raises the a million dollar question, what's the context we live in? And he said it a few verses earlier in verse 29, which we didn't read. He says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who ha have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings, for the present form of this world is passing away. I just want to say to all the single people, being single is awesome. Like, it's awesome. Some creepy dude in the back is like, you know who it is. Like, stop. Like, you're freaking us out. Like, it's awesome. We're the cool kind of Christians who wear sneakers and compare the Bible to characters from The Office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I don't want to compare. It's just, there's beautiful things about being single. Yeah. You think you're busy? Wait till you're married and you have kids. You think you're tired now? Get ready. Your target heart rate's gonna be climbing. <laughs> but like being single's awesome. Like you gotta like you gotta figure out the gold in the season that you're in. It's friggin' awesome and cool and radical, and I'm not at all being patronizing right now. And also it's a season and you better get past it real soon because it won't be awesome forever. Oh, but yeah, it is a gift. The Bible is clear that singleness is a gift from God. That, that's how the Bible talks about singleness. Not like it's some sort of second class status, but rather that it is a gift. And so let me show you that in 1 Corinthians 7, 6 through 7. He calls singleness a gift from God, which I know for many of us, that's not really a gift we want. It's like, oh, you got me some wood? Singleness? Thanks, dad. Like, that's not really what I was looking for, right? Why would he do that if my desire is to be married? Yeah, nobody wants it in the church or in any society that tells them that there are failures for not being married and tells them that the only way they are allowed to have any sort of physical companionship is within a lifelong marriage contract. Yeah, those people might not want to be single because they don't really have any other choice. Well, let me say this. 
if we believe anything this book says about God, which some of us in here do, some of us don't, but, but we're here studying this together. So if we believe anything in here, it says that God is the fountain of all love and of all wisdom. And so what that means is the scripture says he works all things according to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. He works all things according to the counsel of his will. And so what that means is when he gives us something, he is loving and wise and good in doing so. And that means when he gives us singleness, even if we may not want it, there may be something loving and wise to that. And so for some of us, I just want to challenge even your, your picture of God today. Do you trust him that the season he's put you in, as much as you can't appreciate it now, just might be good? What is it like being single? I like it. I like starting each day with a sense of possibility. And I'm optimistic because every day I get a little more desperate and desperate situations yield the quickest results. Singleness is not a stop sign. Singleness is not a period, it's not a comma. Your life doesn't begin when you get married. A boyfriend or girlfriend doesn't make your life start happening. Life is happening. The question is, are you happening? You don't have to live bored and you certainly don't have to be boring when you're single. For a life with Jesus is one big, great adventure. It's full of spontaneity. It's full of ups and downs. And it's time for you to get on mission. Let me just be loud and clear and frank with it. Jesus is a better partner than any spouse could ever dream of being. And maybe he's just waiting for you to figure that out before he blesses you with one on earth. Get on a mission? Oh, it means you volunteer at the church. Is you have to be intentional that you don't waste your singleness. Life, no matter what season you're in, will fly by you without you real, really realizing it. So singleness, again, like we talked about in point one, has a specific purpose. But if we're not intentional in using this season for that purpose, it'll fly right by us and we'll miss what God has for us. If you're single for any length of the time at the church, you will know this so well. They really think your time is their time. You don't have a family. What could you possibly be doing with your time? Come help with the children's ministry. Come serve at the women's night. Come cook at the Pancake Tuesday. Advantages or blessings of, of being single in the ministry. Freedom. Mm -hmm. With respect to time. Mm -hmm. With respect to travel. Freedom with respect to concerns. Mm -hmm. You and I as married men, we've spent our lives concerned about how to provide for a wife, how to provide for children. In marriage, in family life, there are relational needs. And so you and I have to come home in the evening and we think about that. Right. Single person doesn't, doesn't deal with that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it is so easy to find somebody to cat sit, okay. Freedom with respect to finances. We have financial obligations as married, married men, families. A single person, if he's, he or she is wise with their finances, will probably have much more flexibility to invest in kingdom work. I've talked to so many people that only felt value as a single person in the church if they were volunteering. If they weren't being used, they weren't important. Here's what I wanna say. If you're a single man or woman at the Village Church, here's my encouragement to you. I, I wanna try to um, call you out of any holding pattern that you might be in. So if you're a single here and you're like, man, I can't wait. I've got this real desire to do this ministry, to start this ministry, to do this kind of discipleship, to begin to lead out of my passions. But I've got to wait until I find my spouse before I can give myself over to that. Listen, I, I want to call you out. You start to lead us. Right? God's put a passion in your soul, a passion in your heart. You're eager to make disciples. You're eager to start up ministries. You're eager to lead out here. I want to call you to lead out here. You need not a spouse to be a leader. If that's the case, we got to take out a whole slew of ferocious men and women of God in our Bible. God is not waiting for you to get a spouse to lead in a profound way and at a high level. That is a lie from the enemy. I'm calling you out of it and asking you to reject that lie. You are not waiting for a spouse to lead. And so I'm calling you out. You, you lead. you got a passion. Yeah, sure, churches want single people to step up and quote-unquote lead, but they don't want to pay them for it.
Sure, maybe they'll hire a young single woman to be the pastor's receptionist, but they aren't going to hire a single pastor. That's just weird. Besides, we need him to have a wife so we can get her to do stuff for free around the church. That's called a two-for-one deal. And also, married men have never done anything creepy, so it's just safer. But don't worry, single people will have it made in the tribulation. Especially show its advantages in times of persecution and trouble. Hmm. If serious persecution were to ever break out in our country, you know, beyond uh, disapproval and mm -hmm. words, and you're dealing with things like possible pres prison sentences or execution, uh, someone who's single has far less to concern themselves with than someone who's married. But you have way more time because you don't have that pesky family. You know, that thing that is constantly touted as the most important thing ever? That the unmarried man is free from anxieties. I'm free from anxieties? Whoa, that's pretty incredible. Can someone please tell that to my panic attacks? <laughs> yeah, we have fun though. While a married man has to worry about pleasing his wife as well as God, a single man on the other hand can devote much more mental energy just towards serving God. Their father, that I carry these anxieties as a married man, as a husband, as a father, that if you're a married woman, you carry these anxieties. This is according to the text. Paul says, I want to save you singles from the anxieties of being married, that, that I want your focus to be broad and not narrow because the married man or woman, their focus has to be narrow because they're married. As a single Christian, one thing I found was that I was always the guy my married friends made ball and chain jokes to. In a condescending, you think you have a bad kind of tone, but then always ended up with, no, but seriously, I'm glad God brought us together. You'll get it when you're married. It's the old, uh, it's the old ball and chain. And so many people rush into marriage and they never thought it would be difficult. This is hard being with the same person every day. He says as somebody who probably does premarital counseling, I know many people have gotten married, and there is only one type of couple that seemed surprised when things got hard, and that was the young Bible college student who got married so that they could bang. They all got premarital counseling from their pastor. One of those pastors told friends of mine, who are no longer married, that he didn't feel it necessary to talk about sex or money. He says, I'm saying this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. Underline this. I want you to do whatever will help you to serve the Lord the best. So if you're going to date somebody, if you're going to marry somebody, is this going to help you or hinder you in your service to the Lord? If it's not going to help you, then they're not going to help you. You don't have to marry to have a full life. But if you don't have Jesus, you'll always have an empty life. We're gonna be honest with you, marriage is hard. You have way more things to think about and way more things that you have to deal with. Paul knew what he was talking about. You have this time to give yourself completely to the Lord, undistracted from the things of the world and without the big responsibilities that you have with marriage and a family. And once you're married, you'll never get that season back and you'll wish you would have known the gift that it really is. So take advantage of it and take this time to dig a well in God that you will draw from all the rest of your days. Anyone who has spent time as a single person in the church has probably also spent time with that couple who has been married for a couple years so they think they are qualified to give life advice to their single friends. They always have this knowing smile and they fiddle with their wedding rings while they talk to you and they tell you things like how important it is to win over their father first or to always seek the Lord's favor in your relationships. Like when you're single, everything in your house, you own all of it. That's cool. All the money in your bank account belongs to you. The only debt you have is yours. When you're single, you don't have to hide gift receipts, gift cards, poor purchases. Don Shree, I hope you're listening right now. When you're single, you go to a restaurant, you just have to order the one meal. Every dude in this place who knows is in a relationship. You sit down with your girl, she looks at your food and goes, that looks good. 
And as soon as my wife takes a bite, I know it's over. <laughs> get another plate, get another plate, you know? I've been crying for hours. Have you? I had to put my makeup on three separate times because of the tears. Well, third time's a charm. You look, you look fantastic. Let's take some pictures. God has a special plan for you. So last week we talked about marriages. This week we're going to focus on singles, but here's the issue at hand, loneliness. Write this down on your notes. Loneliness always lies. Always lies. When you feel lonely, loneliness lies to you. Single people, you think you wouldn't be lonely if you get married. Married people, can I get an amen? Yeah, right? So listen to me. Single people, marriage isn't going to solve all of your problems. Matter of fact, he can create some. And create some new ones that you didn't even know about. That's what it can do. So listen, God's will for your life, single people, is not to get married, it's to follow him. That's his will for your life. So are all his sermons in a tone that says, I know way more than you and also I believe that you're a toddler? I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. Paul's advocating singleness in this text. And he says, I'm doing it because it provides a freedom from the anxieties and stresses of marriage. That marriage is great. And yet some of you read this and you're like, Distracted by pleasing my wife, Ben, that's a distraction I want to be involved in. But let me tell you something, man, there's going to be all kinds of responsibilities that come with marriage you may be surprised you didn't want. Like you're going to show up in that relationship and right now you just go to work and you come home and you crash on the couch and just let cable wash over you. That's over, man. Those days are gone. I remember for me when I got married, my wife's not a high maintenance person, but as we got engaged... I spent hours, far more than I ever thought I would, at linens and things and bed, bath, and beyond and just holding up plates going, which one do you like better? This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, or this one. And I'm like, I, I can't, I, I can't care. I can't. I'm searching for it. I can't find it. Well, um, actually pretty nice little Saturday. We're, uh, we're going to go to Home Depot. Yeah, buy some wallpaper, maybe get some flooring. Stuff like that, maybe Bed Bath & Beyond, I don't know. I don't know if we'll have enough time. And you're gonna have to spend hours in small talk with in-laws, like, yeah, I do love lawn care. Is this, uh, you know, is this so loam? And you're gonna have to talk about that, and, and then you're gonna have to spend so much money on like a refrigerator and things like that, duvet covers and throw pillows that you're like, how many do we need? Like, who is this for? Who's making us do this? I've never been married or like lived with my partner, but, um. Are throw pillows really the issue that pastors and hack comedians say they are? So yeah, things changed. For example, instead of crashing on the floor in a sleeping bag, now we have a bed with sheets and blankets and comforters and tons and tons of pillows. Like seriously, large amount of pillows. Side note, what's the deal with girls? Why do they need so many stinking pillows? When I was single and traveling and sleeping on floors for all those years, I didn't even use a pillow or even like a towel for that matter. I would just like air dry after showering. My wife, on the other hand, requires like five different pillows in order to go to bed. Two for her head and one for her feet and one for either side. And now get this, my wife wants these things called throw pillows, which aren't even for sleeping on. They're like just for display, just to look at. Someone help me, please. I just, I don't understand. I think one of the hardest things like that people don't talk about is like when you're single, you get to decorate your whole house exactly how you want to do it. <laughs> When I first got married to Don Tree, nobody prepared me for this, but like we, were getting, we got into the first day of the house, she's like, oh, I had this beautiful art piece. She's like, that's gotta go. I'm like, this is, a, this is a beautiful piece of art. What are you talking about? She goes, no, take it down. It was the Michael Jordan Wings poster. I was like, girl? And it's gonna be confusing and you're gonna come home from work and think, oh, I get to just collapse and watch TV. Nah, son, she's gonna sit down and say, how was your day? And a sweeping, fine, isn't gonna cut it. She's gonna want details, details, details. And then she's gonna wanna share details and you're gonna have to listen with your face and go there emotionally and be like, that would bother me too. I don't know how I would feel about that. And you're gonna have to keep processing like that till you die. Oh no, someone will care about you and want to communicate with you. <laughs> that really sucks, dude. I feel for you. 
You know that divorce is legal, right? Like, if you don't like each other, you don't have to live together. Now, am I a victim? No. I, I, I love my marriage. I'm happily married, and I love uh, my kids, and I'm happy to have them. I chose this life, right? Oh, good. Glad to hear you don't hate your wife who insists on caring about your day. That's great. Nah, that's good. You're just, you're just having some fun. But I loved being single. And some people hear that like it's a contrast, like you hate this thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's something I think the enemy does a lot is we tend to sort of amplify the benefits of some other stage and downplay its limitations. And we amplify the limitations of our stage and downplay its benefits. Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy. This is what Albert Einstein said. He said this. He said, men marry women with the hope that they will never change. Women marry men with the hope that they will change. Invariably, they are both disappointed. Uh, Einstein left his wife and then married his cousin, so... The marriage per married people are going to struggle with sexual temptation, but they also know the limits that, that sexual experimentation can, can bring. So you, you have sex, and, and, and you know that it, it does very little to kind of quench sexual appetite, right? It, it doesn't solve anything. Wait, is he saying that married people are better at fighting sexual temptation or better at fighting temptation? In fact, I, I, I heard someone say that the ache for sexual fulfillment is itself the gift. That the longing to be satisfied points to something beyond the satisfaction that you feel in the act of sexual intercourse. That the angst, the longing itself points to something that, that is to come in the return of Christ and the consummation of all things. And then uh, I, I think that singles will struggle with loneliness in a very different way. But yeah, I've heard loneliness can make you do weird things like send inappropriate DMs to women. At Sunday service, lead pastor Matt Chandler told the congregation that several months ago he was approached by a woman here at the church. She told him that she was concerned about the correspondence he had with one of her friends on Instagram. I didn't think I had done anything wrong in that. My wife knew that, her husband knew that. Chandler says he immediately told other senior members who had concerns. And they had some concerns. Um, and those concerns were not that our messaging was romantic or sexual. It, it was that our conversations were unguarded and unwise. The concerns were really about frequency and familiarity. I wonder how he incorporates all his giant hand movements in a DM. I believe in brother-sister relationships here. Um, and yet there was a frequency that moved past that. And there was a familiar, familiarity that played itself out in coarse and foolish joking. It's unbefitting uh, of someone in my position as a lead pastor and as an elder. I'm held to a higher standard and fell short of that higher. In a statement, the church says it hired an independent law firm and found Chandler did not use language appropriate for a pastor and he did not model a behavior that we expect from him. While the elders believe that this did not rise to the level of disqualification, we do hold elders to a higher standard of behavior. The leave of absence to work on himself was seen as the best course of action. He stepped down for like three months and he's back already. And the DMs have yet to be made public, so we have no idea what he said. If I'm on, I'm just really embarrassed. Feel stupid. Thank you. Feel I'd like to see a pastor apology video where they don't downplay their actions and there aren't shouts of support from the congregation. Singleness can also be hard. I mean, remember Genesis 2.18. It is not good that man would be alone. When you're single, you're so much more easily tempted by things. Mostly physical temptations for men and emotional temptations for women. Does he know that some women actually enjoy sex? Like physically enjoy it? Or does his wife let him believe otherwise? But that means it's a great time for you to learn discipline and self-control and to learn how to fight those desires of the flesh with the spirit. And like we've talked about in previous videos, which we will link right up there, this is a great time to build your community, to have accountability, and to invest yourself in those relationships that will help you grow. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it is better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. Why? Because it's better to marry than to burn with lust. Here's the problem. 
Catholics, if you grew up Catholic, you guys get all crazy and excited about remaining single. Oh, the Pope's so single. Oh, that's so amazing. The Pope is not any more holy because he's single. But listen to me. If you grew up in a church like Sandals, you're not any more holy because you're married. Here's what the Bible says. One way or another, your purpose in life is not to get married. Your purpose is to follow God. That's your purpose. That's what you're supposed to do. So listen to me, single people, whether you want to get married or not, whether you enjoy being single or not, Matthew 6, says this, seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. Put God first, and you'll be blessed. Put your desires first, and you'll be cursed. Christians say all the time that marriage is not just about sex, which I personally agree with, which I completely agree with. In fact, some married couples don't even have sex with each other because... That's what they decided between them. But when you read what the Bible says about marriage, it does seem to be just about sex. Basically, don't want blue balls? Get married. (laughs) What a holy union. So if you do feel like you want to date and get married in the future, take this time to get a vision for what that season will look like. What attributes do you desire in a spouse? What are some of the main values that you want to have in common? Take this time to pray through and really ask the Lord what he has for you in your life. Okay, I'll go first. Um, My goal is to fall back in love with my husband. Um, I want us to play and uh, I want to be wooed. I'll go. Uh, this year, I would like to avenge the death of my father. <laughs> he was taken from me 10 years ago, and now I plan to ex- exact my revenge on the individuals who caused me this pain. But for all the condescending talks that churches give about why singleness is great, at the end of the day, they want you to be married. God does call some people to a life of singleness, but he calls the majority of Christians to marriage in the future. So you want to use this time to to do some real self-reflection, to do some real personal development. It's not if you're going to get married. It's assume that you'll get over this being single phase and marry someone. Oh, I'm going to win him to Jesus. No, he's probably going to win you to hell. The most important decision in life is whether or not you accept Jesus. Do you know what the second most important decision in your life is? Who you date and who you marry. Don't screw up either of those. Don't do it. A marriage can be a blessing or it can be a curse. Choose wise. You have to make sure that you marry someone who has the same beliefs as you. And because it is harder to question your faith when you're married to somebody else with that faith and are in the middle of raising a family in that faith, they want you to get married young before you had a chance to question your faith on your own. Back was Morgan said that you know in about four months if you want to marry the person, you know him well enough. Many of you guys were like, no, 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 wait at least a year, wait two years. You don't know someone well enough in four months, that's too fast. Okay, we get it, we get it. To many people, that sounds very fast. We're sharing our hearts here, and you don't have to agree with us. And you know, you can hear things that we're saying and be like, uh, my situation's different, or whatever. We're just asking that you contemplate the words that we're sharing with you. They said that you know someone well enough after four months that you should be able to decide if you should marry them. After four months. I'm not a doctor. I can't diagnose people, but I'm pretty sure that my former best friend is a narcissist. Every time I read something or watch something about narcissists, he ticks off every box. He manipulated me for years. And while he was manipulating me, he was also manipulating girlfriends. One of them, he was able to convince to marry him because he was able to fake being a good person long enough And they were both Christians who believe God wanted them to get married and get married quickly. Um, Marriage is the grace of life. Uh, Marriage is the most fulfilling relationship in life on every possible front. Seems to me like somebody didn't have a cat. Right, Jigger? Thinking that marriage is the best relationship. Okay. And this particular culture we live in today has postponed that uh, 
more and more, it seems like every year the married, the average marriage age gets older and older and older and older. And uh, this puts tremendous pressure on young people to maintain purity when they have reached the age where they would desire to be married and desire to start a family. So all I can do is uh, to exhort Christian people not to get caught up in what you said, not to get caught up in the perfections that this society drags in front of you, which are not related to reality. Oh, God forbid you want to know the person you are married to and know that they are the right person for you. I said, you know, the trend over the last even 50 to 75 years has increased and that people used to get married a lot younger. And I don't think that's because they were much more financially stable. Uh, But now, uh, the older you get, there's wisdom also in waiting, but there's also a lifestyle to sustain the longer that you're single. Oh, the good old days where you got married at 17 so you can start making babies so that enough survive to keep the farm going. Why are you putting off marriage, young person? The average age of the married person, first time, is increasing. I think, give or take, the numbers are on 27 these days, and it appears to be going up more and more and more. That is a societal change. 27. Wow. 27 seems so young to me now. But I remember being a 27-year-old single Christian and feeling like I was such a failure for not being married and that I was way too old to still be single. I remember thinking that if I wasn't at least engaged by 30, then I had really missed the boat. But when I think about who that 27-year-old was, I see a young man who was just starting to figure out who he was. He was just figuring out what he actually wanted to do with his life and what type of people he wanted to be around for long periods of time. That guy was not ready to get married. Which raises the question, what's going on, young person? Well, Karen, you say, perhaps it's because we're struggling to find godly people. And sadly, I think that's the issue. As I travel to different churches, having conversations with different parents and with different young people who are desiring to get married, the lament is, where are the godly spouses? Who are actually married and have been married successfully and are in happy marriages, you're all, this is, this is, this is, you know, there's wide agreement among actually married people. Um, It's only the people that aren't married that that are scandalized by this kind of thing. That should tell you something. Because it doesn't mean that you know, you meet someone and you kind of like them, so you get married the next day. Okay, no one's saying that. We'll run off to Las Vegas and get married in a drive through wedding after one day. No one is saying that. But if you, if you meet them and uh, you like them and you're attracted to them and you're compatible and also you, you note that you have, you know, your, your fundamental values align which is something that you can discover about someone early on by actually like talking to them. If you have real conversations with them rather than inane small talk all the time, you can discover all of that very quickly. And, um, and then at that point, you're like, what, what else is there to wait for? Get married young and get married quick. I'm not saying here that everyone who gets married young is doomed to have a terrible life. But what I am saying is that no one should ever feel pressured into making a huge life decision like that. Should you get married young? Pros and cons. A pro of getting married young is, we're both thinking it, sex. <laughs> give, us, give us a pro or a con, baby. Give us one. All right. A pro is you're young and you meet this person. You just know that you have this best friend for the rest of your life no matter what. If you're going to have that best friend, might as well start it when you're younger than like later in life to have that best friend. These are immature children who give advice on marriage. And there are thousands of people who watch them and listen to them and take their advice to heart. The context. Or are we joining the culture? Oh, man, being you've been married how long? Whoa, how'd you make it that far? That's not the way we should be talking about marriage. We should be raising it up as an ideal. Here's the prize. You want the brass ring? You want the gold cup? Any other 
metallic sort of object. This is it. Marriage is the best thing. Strive for it. Like, if you want to get married, that is awesome. Congratulations. Very happy for you. But you and I both know that it is a journey. It's not a trophy. And you're young and you haven't been in a super serious relationship before. And then all of a sudden you go to be married. And it's like, oh. <laughs> but the Lord also truly blesses our marriage and he will bless your all's marriage if you continue to live for him all right which is why no one who is christian and gets married quickly has ever been divorced those messages that we watched together a minute ago about how singleness is a gift and being married is actually really tough those messages are far and few between this is the message that evangelical culture teaches over and over again. Get married young and get married quick. You'll figure it out. I, I think you have to look at yourself, and this may help, you have to look at yourself in the way that uh, Paul described marriage in Ephesians 5. He basically says that a husband is like a savior to his wife. That's essentially what it says, and, and I, think, I think the burden really lies with men to see themselves as those who rescue women from loneliness, who rescue women from being in an uh, unfulfilled life, from being in, in a place where they aren't protected, they aren't provided for, they aren't cared for, they aren't loved, they aren't given the opportunity to have children. Look, I'm thinking that I got to throw up. So uh, from, from what I would experience in, in our society, it's the men that have to step up. And I honestly do not know what in the world they are waiting for. I have threatened many times to line up all the single women on one side, all the single men on the other side, and assign you a wife. But I, instead of looking for someone who is some kind of trophy, you need to look to someone who loves Christ, that, that you can be a savior to that person and a protector and a provider and, and a lover and um, be what Christ is to his church because that's the picture. That's obviously terrible advice. Your partner is not your savior. They are your partner. You don't need to go around worrying about if you're too late to save some damsel in distress. If you want to get married, again, cool. I don't get it personally, but that's just me. But if you want to get married, that's awesome. But again, they're your partner. You're not saving them. They're not your savior. You're just in it together. Listen to me, ladies. This is what Paul says to you. Don't marry a guy you can't follow. You say, well, I ain't submitting to my husband. Why'd you marry him? Don't marry a guy you can't follow. You need to change the way you pick. The Bible challenges you. Paul says, husbands, you need to be willing to die for your wives. Wives, you need to follow your husbands and trust them. You're like, I ain't never getting married. <laughs> That's why Paul says it's better to remain as I am. But listen to me, single people, you don't get to stay single and get to have sex if you're a Christian. Let me say this very carefully. Some of you aren't Christians. You know what you get to do with your body? Whatever you want. Perfect. Hey, Jagger, I'm going to go leave for a bit and uh, do whatever I want with my body, okay? Yeah, I'll see you in a bit. Bye. Except for the fact that a lot of us were taught this toxic nonsense from a very young age. And it holds on to us. It distorts our views on sex, on relationships, and where our values lie. It's your body. Do whatever you want. If you're a Christian, it's not your body. If you're a Christian, listen to me what the Bible says. You've been bought with a price. You've been purchased. You've been redeemed by God. What advice would you give? Uh, someone said, I'm a woman in my 20s and I'm desiring to be married. What, what advice would you give me? Marry a man. Um, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Again, that's what I see biblically, okay? <laughs> and no, you can marry a man or a woman, whether you're a man or you're a woman, or if you're non-binary, and you can marry a non-binary person, whether you're a man or a woman. As long as, and this is key, the other person also wants to marry you. I remember a few years ago, I was visiting my hometown, and I was pulling into the church parking lot with my dad, and my brother and my sister-in-law were walking to the church, pushing their stroller. It was nice to see. They had wanted a baby for a long time, and, and there they were, a nice little happy family. But then my dad turned to me and said, hey, that's going to be you someday. I think he meant that as encouragement, and he wasn't trying to be passive-aggressive, but it felt a little passive aggressive. So I said, no, I don't think that will be me. And I'm okay with that. And a few months later, we were at my cousin's wedding and some of my cousins and other family members were making a bunch of jokes about me being single. And it started to get to me. I left the venue and went for a walk and my dad followed me. He mentioned that conversation we had and he said he was proud of me and that it was my life to live and not theirs. There are a lot of people on this planet. Some are in relationships with one person, some are in throuples, some are polyamorous, some are married to someone of the opposite sex, some are married to someone of the same sex. Some people want to be in a relationship but haven't found the right person. Some people would be okay with a relationship but it isn't a huge priority to them. And some people just don't want a relationship at all. Where you are within that, does not in any way determine your worth. It's okay to set boundaries and say, I don't like those jokes about me being single. I'm not a joke, I'm just single. If you grew up in this evangelical, get married young culture, there may be some baggage that you still hold on to. Acknowledge that. Find ways to work through that. Go to therapy if you can. Find like-minded people you can talk to. Start a YouTube channel. You're okay where you are. Yeah, you're sweet. Thanks, bud. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for making it this far. If you know somebody who may benefit from watching this, send it their way. And as always, thank you so much, and uh, I love you all. Work, 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 Sky Moon. <laughs>